is an extremely violent person, wouldn't pull any punches. He, he killed people with swords, guns, axes. Both the police and the criminals themselves were in great fear of a man whose behaviour was totally unpredictable, but was always violent. His need for violence was so great, he embraced violence like an old friend. This is the story of the magician, Stuart John Regan. And Mr Death, Dennis Bruce Allen. Two psychopaths who shared a limitless capacity for violence and who murdered their friends just as readily as their enemies. When they died, even the criminal underworld rejoiced. In this episode of Suburban Gangsters, we're delving into the lives of the two most despised crooks of their generations. Alan was the eldest son of crime matriarch Kath Pettingill. He became one of Melbourne's biggest drug dealers and was responsible for up to 13 murders, many committed in his own home. How many people do you think he killed? I think I know about five. Some say there could be as many as 13. Yes, but I don't know all those people. Regan was a pimp, rapist, standover man and child murderer who enjoyed inflicting pain. Stuart John Regan was a malicious, vicious, violent criminal whom I would rate among one of, if not the worst, criminal I ever came across during my entire police career. Of all the criminals I ever knew or dealt with as a crime reporter, Regan would probably have been the most vicious and deadly of the lot, the most heartless. Stuart John Regan was born in the quiet country town of Young, New South Wales in 1945. Not much is known about his early life, apart from his love of violence. Well, if you're ever looking for a psychopath, Regan ticks all the boxes. No one was surprised to learn that as a child, he, um, he killed animals, he, he, he harmed animals. Uh, there was a story that he used a pitchfork to kill a possum. Uh, he killed kittens and dogs, and uh, he just had no empathy for any living uh, being whatsoever. Regan's parents divorced when he was 10, and his mother took off with her boy for the lights of Sydney. They lived in Paddington, a seedy suburb of poor families with lots of children trying to survive. On these streets, young boys learnt to fight, and Regan was a natural. Uh, Johnny Regan came from Paddington, which in those days was a very, very hard and rough suburb. Um, the Paddo boys were renowned, they were tough, and he was the toughest and the most vicious of, of the tough. At the age of 14, Regan attacked a stranger in the street and was sent to a harsh reformatory called Gosford Boys Home. Here he was on the receiving end of brutal beatings, which instead of curbing his violent tendencies, helped to hone them. From Paddington, he gravitated to King's Cross, to the Darlinghurst area, where illegal gambling, prostitution proliferated. He soon made a reputation for himself on the streets. I remember a story about Regan being in King's Cross with a friend, and he'd come across somebody he'd had a disagreement with, bashed him to a pulp, and as the guy lay on the ground, 
mortally wounded, Regan turned to his friend who was smoking a cigarette, made him give him the cigarette, and he stubbed that lit cigarette in the person's eye. That's how vicious Regan was. To earn money, Regan became a pimp. He targeted prostitutes working in the slums and bashed them if they refused to work for him. At 17, he had a string of women paying for his dubious brand of protection. John Regan built up a stable of prostitutes. He, he, he made quite a lot of money out of that, um, and he controlled them through fear and violence. If they didn't hand over as much money as he thought they should have, he slapped them around, there was no doubt about that. If he found out that there was a customer who was misbehaving or wasn't paying, they'd be beaten within an inch of their lives. He was a pretty solid bloke. He was, uh, he was pretty hard and tough, and uh, you could not believe how strong this bastard was. If he grabbed you, he had you. You couldn't get away. His strength made him a formidable standover man and pimp. He formed multiple business partnerships, but his associates would learn that Regan was a very dangerous man to do business with. While Stuart John Regan was building his reputation in Sydney, Dennis Allen was seeking his own in Melbourne. While never as tough as Regan, Allen was smarter and more treacherous. I wouldn't trust him as far as could throw him. He's one of them blokes that just, uh, no, nah, he just had a horrible demeanour about him, mate, you know. I mean, you know, look, these blokes are all good characters and they're dangerous bastards and there's, you know, but there's certain people that are just real low lives. That's where I'd put him, mate. He was a low life. Dennis Allen was a millionaire heroin dealer. He's believed to have committed up to 13 murders and reveled in the nickname Mr. Death, or just Mr. D. Allen would murder people in his own home in front of witnesses. His nephew, Jason Ryan, would later tell police about three murders he witnessed. The most grisly was the shooting and dismemberment of Anton Kenny. Jason Ryan told me that the Atla Motorcycle Club, which had kicked Kenny out, had asked Dennis Allen to kill him. According to Jason, Dennis and Anton were sitting across at a table at Dennis's house, but Dennis had a gun under the table. Shot Anton Kenny dead where he sat. After he shot him dead, Alan cut up his body with a chainsaw. Apparently the chainsaw became clogged and the boys had to use a meat cleaver to finish the job. Wendy Pierce told me that she actually came into the place with Victor Pierce while Dennis Allen was cutting up Anton Kenny's body with a chainsaw. And uh, Victor Pierce had, had grabbed one of uh, Kenny's feet and chased Wendy around the house with it, you know. So this was the level of madness they were living in. Anton Kenny's dismembered body was then stuffed in a 44 gallon drum, which was tossed into the Yarra River. So this is a guy who doesn't care about the consequences of his behaviour. He doesn't really care about good or wrong. He's just doing what he's doing. He's evil by our judgment, but by his judgment, it's day-to-day -day stuff. And that's the thing that we all have trouble with, because we all live our lives by rules. We understand this thing called the social contract. We won't go so far, because if we go that far, then we lose something that we value. He doesn't value anything except himself. Dennis was born on Melbourne Cup Day, 1951, to a 16-year-old girl called Kathy Pettingill. He was the eldest of the 10 children she would bear. Kath was probably a wild 16-year-old when she got pregnant with Dennis. 
The father skipped off to the uh, Korean War as soon as he could. And uh, then she had another child. And then they all moved in with the uh, grandparents. And for a long time, Dennis and his younger brother Peter thought that the grandparents were his parents and that Kath was the sister. Now, that was incredibly significant in Dennis's life. It must have been incredibly traumatic. It would be another 15 years before Dennis learnt that Kathy was his mother and that his nephews and nieces were, in fact, stepbrothers and sisters. But then uh, she met Billy Pierce. They had another six kids, some of whom were adopted out because obviously there were concerns about the dysfunctional home life. And then there was Pettingill. And Pettingill had already a couple of tribes of his own. So this was a, a, a tangled up dysfunctional family. Dennis's journey to becoming a violent, twisted man began with this deception and later with domestic violence. When he was about three, Kathy's mother, Gladys, who was a pretty shocking character, Gladys used to take to Dennis with a broomstick and beat the living daylights out of him with the, with the broom handle. Dennis grew up in a rough public housing estate called Olympic Village. It was built to house the athletes during Melbourne's Olympic Games in 1956, but soon degenerated into a ghetto and a petri dish for crime. Dennis grew up in a, in a criminal family. He, he, from an early age, th that's what he knew. He, he'd grown up, uh, you know, small arm robberies, uh, petty thefts, assaults. He started working for a firm of panel beaters in Frankston. This is when he was in his early teens, and he would take the biggest and fastest car off for a run after everybody had left the premises at night. And he started to come to the attention of police. According to Harry Allen, they beat the living daylights out of him on more than one occasion, him and Peter, his, his younger brother. And I think this is when Dennis started to harden up. He had by now recognised that if you want to survive in this world, you struck the first blow, you didn't wait. Age 13, he was sent to Tirana Boys' Home for theft. The culture at Tirana was described as controlled by punishment. There was no focus on the welfare of the juvenile offenders. When people go in and they go through the juvenile justice system in the old days, certainly, where it is a gladiator school, then they come out often a lot more upset about society in general. They feel they don't fit, they're made not to fit, and because they're, they're now labelled misfits by society, they often see that as being a reason to become a misfit. Inside Tirana's walls, Dennis was schooled in violence. His grandfather, Harry Allen, was on the receiving end of his rage when Dennis finally returned home. Now, Harry Allen adored Dennis. Dennis put Harry in hospital more than once, beat the living daylights out of him, but then would come to the hospital the next day and say, because um, he called him Dad, I'm really sorry, Dad, I shouldn't have done it, and give him a kiss on the forehead as he lay in his hospital bed, black and blue. And Harry Allen told me, he said, look, I, he did terrible things to me, but I loved him, and there was a soft side to Dennis. Dennis wasn't Kathy's only problem child. Every one of her sons, including the youngest, Jamie, had an appetite for violence. Young Jamie Pentagall's got a 22 calibre young American, and he's going like this to the, to the cat, he's going, bang, bang, bang. Bang, and he's pulled the trigger and he's gone bang! And the, cat's, the gun's gone off and he's actually shot the cat. And Dennis has turned around and says, Oh, good one, Jamie! <laughs> good one! Oh, he's discharged a weapon in the lounge room and shot the cat. And, and Den Dennis Allen's, Oh, good one, Jamie! <laughs> good one! You know? Highly, highly amused. But this was just a taste of the casual brutality and horror that would later take place in Alan's home.
Reagan was known to be a dangerous man for his own particular ends. He made associations to suit himself. He ended associations to suit himself. He killed his peers, he killed his rivals, he killed anyone and hurt anyone who got in his way. John Regan earned the nickname The Magician and it had nothing to do with his prestigious abilities. Um, people who befriended John Regan tended to disappear. Regan was paranoid. He always feared that someone may have known too much about he, him and his activities. If he thought that, good night, Irene. In January 1967, Regan, who was well known to police for assault, robbery and rape, added murder to his criminal resume. His victim was a fellow pimp and business associate called Barry Flock. Barry Flock was involved with John Regan in a car rebirthing scheme. Police arrested Barry Flock and charged him with, with possession of stolen cars and um, a bail was set at a reasonably high price. Um, now, not long after that, John Regan himself bailed Barry Flock out. Now, Barry Flock never turned up for court. Barry Flock disappeared. Barry Flock was another victim of the magician because Barry Flock knew too much about John Regan's involvement in car rebirthing. Police had no evidence or witnesses with which to charge Regan. Getting away with murder set the magician on a killing spree. His murders became strategic. He eliminated associates who had the potential to implicate him in one of his many crimes. One of the magician's first vanishing acts was performed on Ross Christie, a partner in a women's dress shop where they used to sell stolen goods. Next was Eric Williams, whose disappearance allowed Regan to consolidate his hold on Sydney's brothels. It's believed he got away with as many as eight murders. The police were also aware of what he was doing and what his antics were, but it was incredibly hard to get any evidence against him. In fact, uh, he f I think the only time he was in jail was for a string of uh, car offences, uh, traffic offences, that uh, he was... Uh, the allegations of, uh, of assault, vicious assault, perverting the course of justice, burglary and other charges just fell by the wayside simply because you couldn't find witnesses who testified. They were too scared of him. He feared no one, not even the toe cutter gang, ruthless pirates who would torture other crooks into giving up their stolen loot rather than pulling their own jobs. The leader of the gang was Kevin Gore. He was last seen walking down a street with Regan. Gore disappeared, and I've got no doubt that uh, Regan ended up with Gore's cash. Police found no evidence to tie Regan to his death. But rumours of his involvement only helped to cement his reputation as a man to be feared. Dennis Allen, on the other hand, was just getting started. And like Regan, Allen was a rapist. Age 22, Dennis Allen was sentenced to nine years in jail for the kidnap and brutal gang rape of a 19-year-old woman. Inside Pentridge Prison, Allen made connections with major drug dealers. When he was released five years later, he used his contacts to help set himself up as a heroin supplier. At his peak, he was earning the equivalent of $200,000 a week in today's money. Once he got into the drug trade and was really coining big money, he uh, became more dangerous than anything. And of course, what happens in the drug trade, there are feuds. And he was responsible for a whole series of murders. A loyal and obedient family helped Alan build his drug empire. 
They became known as the Clan, Victoria's most notorious criminal brood. So when you think of the what became the uh, Allen Pettingill Pierce family, you have to think of a very dysfunctional unit, not not a real family. It was kind of a primitive urban tribe, a crime gang bound by blood in more ways than one. Nephew Jason Ryan was one of Dennis's most trusted family members and witnessed three of his uncle's murders. Jason told me he was very scared of his uncle and um, felt obliged to become complicit in his, in his criminal activities a lot of the time for fear that, I guess, uh, his uncle would kill him. Jason Ryan recalls the murder of Wayne Stanhope. Jason said it was his first that he witnessed at the hand of, of his uncle Dennis. Wayne was a so-called friend of Dennis Allen. Wayne Stanhope came out of Geelong prison to visit me. I forgot to tell him that I didn't get on well with Dennis Allen. I should have said, because he didn't tell me he was going to go and visit Dennis Allen. And then when he left me, he goes up to see Dennis Allen. And, and Dennis, and he goes into Dennis Allen's place at Stephen Street, Richmond. And Dennis said, where you been, uh, Wayne? He said, I've just come back from seeing Chopper. He said, Chopper Reed? He said, yeah. He said, oh, Wayne Stanhope's stand got up to change his record. So Dennis Allen shot him in the back of the head with a 38. He did that because Wayne Stanhope came to visit me in Pentridge. And I, I bashed Dennis Allen in Pentridge with a, with a rolling pin. Allen was heavily addicted to speed. At the height of his drug taking, he was injecting a phenomenal seven grams of pure speed every day. Cathy claimed that he used to sometimes go without sleep for 10, 11 days in a row, which is probably hard to believe, but the stories of his drug use are, are, are so stupendous that um, I do tend to believe her when she says that, and you didn't go near Dennis when he was like that, because he didn't know who he was, who, who he was with. He once tried to kill Kathy because he didn't recognise her as his mother, let alone his sister. That particular drug, unlike many other drugs, very quickly leads to a sense of psychosis. It does damage to the brain, it does damage to Areas of the brain that are involved in problem solving, personality, he would have had frequent episodes of psychosis. Mental instability, emotional instability, lack of emotional control. One, one occasion when Kathy came home from a massage parlour and Dennis used to line the bathroom with black plastic floor, ceilings and walls and he would take people into there and, and, and bash them senseless and then he would go away and have a drink and um, stick some, some methadone into his arm and then resume the bashing. And one night, Cathy came home and there was a barely conscious body lying in the hallway with a machete in the back of his head. Dennis and his soldiers were in the room watching television and drinking and injecting speed. They were waiting to finish him off and Cathy got that boy out. The young man narrowly escaped with his life but it was only a matter of time before Dennis would explode and commit another murder. He was one of the worst human beings that ever walked the streets of Sydney. He was a psychopath. He was a child murderer. He was just a horrible human being who ultimately got his just desserts. How child killers seen by uh, criminal groups? No, he, he, he was a fucking... He, he was a maggot, Stuart Ta Johnny Regan, he was, he was a maggot. And, uh, you know, I'm glad he got killed. Just a fucking maggot. She'd kill a maggot, you know? Well, the downfall of John Regan started with the disappearance of Carlos Scott Huey. Carlos Scott Huey was the son of prostitute Helen Scott Huey, who lived with John Regan. She was his girlfriend. 
John Regan claimed that he'd gone to Taylor Square in Sydney at 4am to buy a newspaper. And he gave police this story that he just left Carlos briefly in the car while he went to get a newspaper, came back and Carlos was gone. Police are appealing to the public for any information that can help locate a missing two-year-old boy. Carlos Scott Huey was left alone in a car in Flinders Street, Darlinghurst on May 22 and was later reported missing. He has not been seen or heard of since and his present whereabouts are unknown. Everyone, the, the public, the media, the gangsters, the police, had no doubt whatsoever that Carlos had disappeared because Regan had killed Carlos. The theory was Regan, who had a bad temper, was babysitting Carlos while his mother was out working, earning a quid. Carlos began to cry. Regan couldn't take the crying and he snapped. In snapping, he somehow killed Carlos. He dumped Carlos's body somewhere went to Taylor Square as a subterfuge and then contacted the police in a panic to say that someone had taken Carlos. The Carlos incident also exemplified the fact that during that era, the criminals had no compunction about attacking each other doing things to each other that would have appalled general society. But by and large, they had a creed which said, we won't interfere with the squareheads. They thought the people who went to church and obeyed the laws were squareheads. They would do terrible things to each other. There was no holds barred in dealing with each other. But as far as the squareheads and most of all children was concerned, they were total no-go areas. Regan had crossed a line that the criminal milieu itself did not understand. The thing that especially abhorred both the police and indeed the other criminals of the time was that Regan then made a grab for publicity by actually offering a substantial reward for anybody who could have information about the disappearance of Carlos. Regan's heart was so cold and black that he taunted police and the boy's mother by offering up false leads as to where Carlos's remains might be found. He sent police to a house in Woolloomooloo where they found bones beneath the floorboards. I remember where he put dog bones down at the Woolloomooloo and said, oh, there's bones here, you know, probably the, this is where this little bloke is. He'd do that because that would, that would be his kick. You know, being a psychopath, that would be, he'd be getting a huge amount of fun out of that uh, because that's, that's how he thought. That's, that just goes to show what, what a raving bloody rat bag he was, for Christ's sake. While Carlos's body could not be found, Regan remained free. Everyone knew he was guilty but no one was brave enough to say it to his face. Except for one man, an SP bookie and standover man by the name of Ratty Jack Clark. This confrontation would lead to the eventual demise of both men. He was the sort of crook who would kill a man or, or a woman for that matter through paranoia or if he went nuts on one of his many methamphetamine binges. I mean, they didn't, they didn't call him Mr Death for nothing. Dennis Allen's drug-induced paranoia led him to committing multiple murders in his own home. Dennis liked to do his killing at home. He was a creature of habit, uh, you know, he, People used to say that he'd ring you up and ask you over to kill you. 
So there was numerous murders carried out in, 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 within his empire of, of, of properties in the uh, Cremorne area of uh, inner city Melbourne. Among the victims was one of Alan's dealers, a prostitute and junkie named Helga Wagner. Dennis became convinced she was ratting him out to the police. He lured her to his home, offering a taste of a new supply of heroin he'd just received. He knew Helga could not resist such an invitation. According to Jason Ryan, Dennis gave her a hot shot of heroin. Didn't quite kill her. Dennis then ordered Jason to run down to the nearby Yarra River with a bucket, come back with it full of the Yarra River water. Dennis then proceeded to pour that water down Helga Wagner's throat. Jason recollects that she reminded him of a whale. She kept spitting the water out and wouldn't die very easily. Uh, apparently it took Dennis several attempts to actually drown her and then her body was thrown in the Yarra. As Melbourne's biggest heroin and amphetamine dealer, Alan wasn't short of money. He bought his headquarters, two houses in Stevenson Street, Cremorne, for cash. Soon he was buying more properties in the adjoining streets for his family members and foot soldiers. Residents soon complained of loud music, screaming and gunshots, day and night. Police began surveillance and set up their operations in the recently closed Rosella Soup Cannery nearby. There's a story about how he would get in these paranoid rages and walk out and ping a few shots at them as they were doing surveillance and other police were asked to, to ask Dennis, please, Dennis, please don't shoot at the guys in the Rosella factory because they're only doing their job. And, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Because he was, he was a lover of police. Paradoxically, for a guy who, who, who was so on the other side of the law, he loved police, would always assist them. And Dennis Allen, when it suited him, would inform to the police to keep himself out of jail. He rang me one night and uh, oh, about midnight, and he said, you better get over here. I've got a case full of fucking money. Well, he'd already rung another policeman, so we go over to his address in Richmond. We find this, uh, this fellow handcuffed around a pole in his backyard, and we found a case full of forged shorty dollar notes. They're the kind of things that Dennis Allen would do. Uh, where he got the handcuffs from, I didn't ask him, but when we got there, our prisoner was there, and he took us around and showed us the various places where they had done the printing. He was clearly involved in several murders, but um, the amount of information he was giving to members of the breaking squad and the consorting squad on other people, the crooks that, uh, that he knew or was associated with, was incredible. There were times when you had one set of Victoria Police who were trying to load Dennis Allen up with a gun and another lot who were trying to cut them off and give Dennis a warning. Got to a ludicrous situation um, where he, he got bail in the most ridiculous circumstances, but uh, he was that useful to certain police. I mean, it, it got to the stage where he felt so untouchable that he hatched a plot to blow up a court, for instance. Still got bail. And there's absolutely no doubt, given the number of times that Dennis appeared in court on serious charges ranging from murder on down and was granted bail time after time after time. And Quite often, the reason that he was granted bail was because a police officer stood in the dock and said, um, I, I support this man's application for bail. Their whole attitude was that Dennis is much more used to us on the outside as an informer um, and passing on information to us than if he stuck behind bars. However, Dennis Allen's days as a protected species were soon to end. And his greatest threat came not from the police or the underworld, but from himself. His drug fueled lifestyle would eventually catch up with him. He had a hair trigger temper. 
he immediately resorted to violence, a sort of violence that you couldn't predict. Regan's murder of a two-year-old boy had put a target on his back. But without a body, the police were powerless to charge him. The arrogant Regan then waged a media war against the police. He was in the habit of ringing newspapers constantly, alleging that police were, were threatening to load him up with, with false evidence, to verbal him, which means uh, uh, make statements, false statements against him. It was all untrue, but this was part of Regan's tactics to put the heat on the police and keep them off his back. Unlike the hardheads who'd been involved in Sydney's organised crime scene for many years, who understood that they cooperated with the key police and kept a low profile. Regan had started dealing with the afternoon newspapers and for the police that he couldn't make an arrangement with, he decided to form a what he called a citizen's vigilante group and he supplied the newspapers and the police hierarchy with documentation of who he believed were corrupt police that he wasn't dealing with. Killing a kid and taking on the cops was reason enough to get rid of Regan. However, it was when Regan killed ratty Jack Clark that he signed his death warrant. Clark was a good mate of Sydney's criminal godfather, Lenny McPherson. Ratty Jack accused John Regan, and he was the first person to do it to his face, accused John Regan of having killed the boy. Well, not long after that, Regan shot Ratty Jack Clark. You're going back to Lenny McPherson's famous saying, Roger, you can control a bad man, you cannot control a madman. And he was the perfect example of a mad, mad man who had overstepped the mark, even amongst the criminal milieu, and he had to be made an example of. And that's exactly what they did. The reaction of the major crime figures like McPherson and Freeman was to uh, want some sort of justice and retribution. So a fellow called Paddles Anderson was brought into the picture. Now Paddles was a very vicious old standover man in Sydney from the 30s. By this stage of course he was a lot older but he still was trading on a very substantial reputation and he was also involved in the criminal element as a mediator, as a fix-it, as a go-to man to smooth over problems and this was a problem. Frederick Paddles Anderson was one of the few men Regan trusted, and so he was the natural choice to entice Regan to his death. Getting close enough to murder Regan was no easy feat. With some justification, he was always armed to the teeth and seldom travelled without bodyguards. Unusually, Regan arrived at the meeting without any protection. Three gunmen stepped forward, each shot him several times, uh, and that solved a problem. While it's never been proven, it's believed that the gunmen were the men who ran Sydney at that time. Stan Smith, Lenny McPherson and George Freeman. It was a public execution on a city street a ritualised killing that sent a message to any others of Regan's ilk. The magician was shot eight times, one for each of his kills. His executioners believed they'd performed a community service for the people of Sydney. The minute that the news reached uh, prisons in New South Wales, particularly Long Bay Jail, um, the cheers erupted and you, you, you could hear them uh, for, for miles and miles. Everyone was happy that Regan was gone. Everyone. Everyone, including the police. John Burke and Roger Rogerson visited Regan's corpse in the morgue. There he was lying on this slab, like uh, all dead people are. We were about to have a post-mortem performed upon them, naked. Uh, and we were all amazed. He still had this 
smirk on his face. He had a, a scar on his face, I remember, and he had a, a smirk, uh, <laughs> even in death. He'd been a thorn in the side of so many police for so many years, and he was such an evil, vicious man. To see him dead uh, brought no, no sorrow to me. To have built up a reputation the way he had and to have been feared and despised, uh, you just can't believe that he only lived 29 years. He did all of that, all those evil things, in 29 years. At 29, he was dead. Only his mother, Claire, lamented his passing, but she, of all people, knew he would never make old bones. I'm sure John knew his days were numbered. I did too. I've known for at least two years that it had to happen like this. Sometimes I feared he would die in my arms out the front of this house. Only a few weeks ago, I pleaded with him to change his ways. Mother, he said, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't gamble. I keep a clear head. They've nailed John to the cross this week. They've crucified him and broken my heart. I loved him dearly. Regan's mother mourned her son's death, and she went to her grave believing he was not guilty of killing a toddler. Mothers always remain loyal but not Dennis Allen's mum, Kath Pettingill. She knew there was pure evil in Dennis. It got to a stage where I didn't know how it was going to end, because we were all in trouble. I was out on bail. My young son was out on bail. My other young son had been murdered. I thought, where's it all going to end? I want a normal life. So I said to young Jason, I'm going in there and I'm going to have to kill Dennis. So you actually seriously thought about killing your own yes, son? Yes, I did. I did. I was driven that far. To protect the others, I would have had to kill Dennis. This is just before his stroke on January the 19th, uh, 1987. Yeah, I was seriously thinking about it all over Christmas. Before his death, the once terrifying psychopath was frail and wheelchair bound. A rare heart condition and a lifetime of drug abuse had taken its toll. He was no longer a threat or a useful police informant. Witnesses once too scared to talk found their voices and police who'd once protected him turned their backs. To me, he served a purpose. Uh, to a lot of people, he was just a drug dealer and a murderer and uh, and uh, he lived by the sword and he died by the same sword. He died of overdose of drugs and alcohol and uh, he got his right whack. At the time of his death, aged just 35, he faced a total of more than 60 charges, ranging from possession of firearms and explosives right through to murder. News of Dennis Allen's death elicited the same outpouring of joy that Regan's had. Regan and Alan faded quickly into history, but there were many more like them coming. From dysfunctional families and boys' homes, they emerged with hate in their hearts and a cold disregard for the consequences. <laughs> 